Hello everybody, my name is Liam Walken and today we'll be turning this into this. And we're going to show you how we did that. Starting off with some demolition and I did make a full in-depth video on this project and on demolition if you're interested in that. If you have a project upcoming or you're just interested in learning how to do this, I would recommend checking that out because in this we'll just be going over the cliff notes. Just start off by removing this giant tub, we disconnect the plumbing and the tile surround, and we can lift it out of place. I would recommend having two people, as these things are a little bit hard to manage, uh, and if you're alone and you're not trying to donate it, you can always cut it in half, although that makes some people a little bit angry. This wall for the shower will be coming out, we're going to open things right up, and a part of that means disconnecting this plumbing. Now before removing any walls, you need to confirm whether they are load bearing or not. It's very unusual for shower stalls to be load bearing, that being said, not telling you that that's always the case. And anytime you need to remove framing like that, using the sawzall, cutting things in half and then using leverage is a really good way to get things out. And for removing tile when possible, if you can get it out in chunks, that's going to save you a lot of time. So kind of just getting a line through walls like that and then ripping the backer board from the framing is usually a really nice method. Removing this water closet, and I know some of you are going to really dislike this decision, but it's not your bathroom. This is what the clients wanted. They wanted a really open concept. They didn't care for the privacy of a separate water closet there. So we got rid of it and it really opened things up. Again, I understand this is not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it was theirs and that is what's important. With this project, we actually did a bunch of work in the master bedroom here as well. Got rid of the popcorn ceiling, painted, uh, all new trim, whole bunch of stuff going on here. And a part of this project was moving this wall. Got very lucky, this was not a load bearing wall, so we could get rid of it. And we ended up getting an additional, I believe it was 16 inches worth of space in the bathroom. It was just not necessary to have that space in the bedroom as it was already so big and this worked out to just be a much more useful floor plan. With all of the walls out, we can start to clean everything up. So repairing all the vapor barrier and disconnecting a lot of this old electrical. There was a lot going on here. So just removing a lot of the old, starting fresh, really helped out. Moving on to the framing, and this wall is really important. There's gonna be a lot happening here. And it's over 16 feet long, so we framed it in two sections. In this wall, we're gonna have a three foot pocket door. We're gonna have power, we'll have lighting, floor heat, a shower niche, the shower controls, and even a TV. So a lot of planning had to go into this. This is the pocket door rough in. So we're just installing the top first with our rough framing opening. And we use a laser level to make sure it's perfect. And then we can get these steel studs in, which are really rigid and straight. Uh, very nice kit here for a good price point. This is the Johnson series pocket door with the soft glows. And then we cut some plywood down and they had these little strips to attach them to. And that's going to give us some backing if we ever want to put anything into this wall. And then framing out all of the additional features going to this wall. So a very rough opening for the niche, some support, uh, some backing for our switches there to keep them off the casing of the door, uh, the backing for the shower valve, shower handheld and shower head, and all sorts of other fun little things here. This is the floor heat roughen. So we got a four x four deep box with a mud ring on it. We can run two half inch ENT conduits down the wall, notch out the bottom plate, and then just get those conduits flush with the bottom plate there where it meets the floor. 
we will be building up the floor in this bathroom for our curbless design so just added an extra little piece down there to get it to the right height in this wall here we actually had a total of five receptacles we have two above the vanity uh, one underneath and then two accessible through the tower unit cabinet on the left hand side where they can charge all sorts of different appliances we will have a three gang switch box going in and for this we will be able to control the fan the led mirror and the pot lights i like to rough mine in just like this i prefer metal boxes get all the neutrals together and then i can kind of organize my heads and label everything and i like putting in a temporary switch so we can have some lighting as we're working here a big problem with these builder grade bathrooms is the exhaust fan so we're going to move ours to be closer to the shower and then upgrade it we're using the panasonic whisper with the fits flush mount cover two products that work well together add some blocking in around our hole attach the electrical to the fan and then screw it all up manage all the vapor barrier and then we will attach the duct from the attic later on and this thing will just get mudded over and it's going to look beautiful Cutting open our shower floor so that we can recess it. We do want a curbless shower, so we need to recess our subfloor here. And we do have I-beam style joists. So what we're going to have to do is rip down some plywood, glue and staple it to the sides. And then this way, the plywood will be flush with the top of those I-beam style joists. What we can then do is take some 2x4 and glue and nail and even screw it all together. This way, it's going to be a really, really tight bond. We want to use a ton of fasteners here, ton of glue, get it all snug, and we want to build something that's going to last forever. Once all the framings in and the necessary areas are recessed, we can cut our plywood sheets out and then glue and screw them down using some flooring screws here use a ton of them again we want this to be solid since we're going for a curbless design and we're unable to notch down our joists in this situation we have to build up the rest of the floor so here we're using 3 8 plywood we're gluing and stapling it down again a ton of staples good healthy amount of glue here we want to give little expansion gaps around all the plywood and just fasten everything down we got a five inch hole saw running in reverse to cut out the holes for the tub and shower drains here. To install our floor heating, we need a very clean substrate first. So we're gonna go ahead and vacuum off all of our subfloor here. Take a damp sponge and just get rid of any little bits of dust or debris that are remaining. And then we can take this Dietra heat peel and stick and literally just peel off the back and stick it down to the floor. We're using a roller here to get a really good bond. You don't need this though. You can absolutely just walk around and tamp it down, but it is pressure activated. So the more you tamp it, the stronger the bond will be. To install the heating cable, I'm just using a grout float and I'm going for a nice spacing here. I did prior to this mark everything with a sharpie of the areas that I can't run the floor heat and we just kind of want to run it in a way that makes sense for where you're going to have all the foot traffic. The heating cable cannot be cut and it does have this bulky unit that has to stay in the floor side. It's a little bit annoying. You have to cut out the Dietra heat where this is going to sit and sometimes you may even want to notch the subfloor a little bit for this to sit completely flush but in our case, we're going to have large format tile, a lot of thin set to help build this thing up, so I'm not worried about that. We're going to go ahead and fish the two sensing probes up as well. And I'm just going to use this two-part glue just to make sure everything stays down. It's not going to interfere during the tiling process. Then I have all the wires up at the thermostat box, and I'm just going to tuck them in for the time being. Unfortunately, I didn't do the greatest job in getting our subfloor completely flush with the top of these joists so I just took a planer and shaved down any high spots and kind of sanded out the edges as well and with that we could start closing everything up regular old drywall for the ceiling here we don't want any sagging and then for all of the walls we're going to be using the green board that is the mold and mildew resistant drywall
We have curdy board for the waterproofing in the shower and using the associated washers to fasten it in. Great product, lightweight, easy to work with. And when you're doing a corner shower like this, you really only need two, three sheets depending on the size of your shower. So it's just a really nice way to get this done. A lot of mudding work on this job and the first step is to pre-fill any of our larger gaps and cracks. So Sebastian here taking some sheetrock 45 or sheetrock 20 and just gonna fill all of those gaps. Taking a 72 by 48 inch shower pan here, and I'm just gonna cut down both ends to get it to the size that we need. Mark it with a straight edge and then just cut it with a skill saw. It's foam, so it gets really easy. You could even use a knife to do this. This is the island tub drain, which we're just gonna glue into the trap below and then screw it down into the subfloor to secure it. And a very similar concept for the shower drain here, minus the screws. So we're just gonna glue it into the trap below and then it's actually gonna be thin set into place. For thin set, we will be using Schluter's All Set, a fantastic quality thin set. However, very expensive, so I only use it for the waterproofing. And we've got the whale tail attachment on the vacuum. It's gonna help control all the dust as we mix this inside. Gonna mix it up per the manufacturer's instructions, let it slake for a bit, and then remix it. Got a bucket of water there to clean off the drill. I am using the Curdy trowel for the waterproofing here, so I'm just troweling out the thin set and then covering it with a bunch of banding. Not really concerned about being pretty here as this is practical and it's gonna be covered up. For the shower pan, first things first, we need to just slightly dampen the subfloor and then trowel out our thin set. I believe this is a quarter inch trowel. Gonna get it all directional and then tamp my pan into place. I can then glue my drain, get some thin set as well, and then get all of the waterproofing around the corners, band it all up. Now, I do like to flood test all of our showers, but with this one, it's curbless. So what that means is I'm gonna build a temporary curb so that we can go ahead and flood test it. However, I don't know if I'm sold on this. Reason being is that the next day when you remove this temporary curb, you end up risking pulling off the waterproofing. And that's what happened on this job. When I removed the curb the next day, some of the waterproofing came up, so I had to redo it. And I'm just not sure if it's worth it. It seems like a little bit of a risky maneuver. I think moving forward, what I might do for these curbless showers is skip the flood test altogether, use the curdy method for waterproofing as always, and then possibly think about doing a coat of liquid membrane over top. I'm going to do some testing and see, but I'm just not sold on this temporary curb. When it comes to the floor here, we're using a large format tile, which means we have to make an envelope cut. That is the X kind of pattern, which gives us the relief cuts needed to get all of the correct slope for this shower pan. What we're doing here is I actually marked the pan on the exact pitch of the prefabricated slope that it has, and I'm just gonna trace those lines onto my tile so that I can cut them out. However, in the past, what I've done is I've just gone from the corner of the drain grate to the corner of the shower pan, and I will be going back to that moving forward. I think it's just a better look, and even though it's slightly off of the prefab pitch of the pan, it doesn't throw it off in any meaningful way. We'll still have all of our slope necessary. Just a very minor detail, but something I wanted to just make a note of. A lot of ugly drywall joints going on here where old meets new. So for that, Sebastian here using the larger five of use tape, and that really helped us get a beautiful finish. Canadian winters means cutting inside, so we just set up a little bit of a waterproof booth kind of thing. Got a nice plastic drop sheet and then a couple moving blankets over top to absorb any water that does get out of this saw. And as far as the cuts go, just draw a line and then mark the start and end of the blade up with that and then do a couple pass throughs to get a clean cut. For the more intricate cuts like this drain, using a grinder and then a cone to get all of the nice rounded corners for the drain grate here. Want a really sharp finish on this thing, make it nice clean look. And any of the cuts that we made that will be exposed, we polish up with a polishing pad. So we don't want any sharp tile edges on the shower floor. 
Before installing this tile, I like to do a dry fit to ensure that it's going to work out nicely. So here, just using these horseshoe spacers, they're 1 16th, and then I can kind of lay things out. And if there's any adjustments that I need to make, I can make them now, as opposed to once we have the thin set all made up. And we did make up our thin set, and as mentioned earlier, redoing the waterproofing where that curb was, and extending it past the shower area just to be safe. Here we're using a half inch square notch trowel to install this large format tile, back buttering each and every piece. And I don't use any spacers or anything until I get to around the drain grate. Once I have all of the tiles surrounding that drain grate, I can kind of get things to look nice, align everything in the way that I need it. And we can go back with these wedges and start locking things into place. We are using 1 16th grout lines here and these wedge spacers are really nice I get some confusion with this on people not understanding how this works with an envelope cut. Um, it does not pull up the tiles enough so that it throws the pitch off. So while we have different planes meeting, it doesn't force them up enough to make everything flat. It just gets the edges flush with one another. So you can, yes, if you're doing an envelope cut like this or anything where you have slope, you can still use these wedges and it's not going to throw it off. You still want to check. I recommend having a level anytime you're tiling. And especially if you have something where your pitch matters, have your level handy so you can just confirm that you still have the slope that you need. And then just carrying on with the rest of the floor. So we're just going to work our way out of the shower. Same methods. Everything's going to be pretty standard here. We have a toothbrush lying around, which you can see. It's really nice for cleaning out the grout lines while the thin set's still wet. It's just an easier process to clean it when it's wet versus once it's hardened. And this tile, I believe, was called linen, and it's a beautiful tile, but it was not the best to work with. It is a rectified tile, meaning it should all be the exact same size. However, I found that there was some variation between tile sizes. Not anything significant, maybe a 64th difference between certain tiles, but the 64th is a big deal when you're using 1 16th grout lines. So uh, this floor was a little bit of a headache to install, but we did get there in the end. For cleanup, we need to first remove the wedges. I like to just kick them out of place, although Sebastian goes for the rubber mallet. Either way works just fine. With all the wedges out, we can kind of sweep them up, uh, get rid of any debris. We're going to go around with a knife and just clean out the grout lines. You want to be careful. You don't want to pierce any waterproofing or heating cables. So you only want to just clean out a little bit of the grout lines enough to get the grout into. And we're going to vacuum, get a nice damp sponge, microfiber maybe, wipe everything down, get it clean. And then we can cover these floors up with some brown paper and some tape. Even more mudding and we're just scratching the surface with what this project took. But again, our basic process is sheetrock 45 or 20 for pre-filling, green box of mud for taping, and then amber or yellow box of mud or machine mud that is for the next few coats. Tiling these walls and we do have a slight issue which is of course tile size versus your standard 8 foot ceiling. If we were just to do full tiles all the way up we'd end up with a 2 inch sliver at the very top. And what you could do is just cut your first row in half. That way your first and last row could both be a half tile. However, here, there were a lot of factors going into this. We wanted our tile to end at a nice height below the window. We want a nice height for our niche. So what we did here is we just had our sliver cut as the very first row. A lot of it will be hidden by the tub or behind the glass. And typically you're just not looking down low like that. So we figured the best possible results here was having that sliver on the bottom. And that way we could have a nice tile height for our niche, for our window, and end on a full tile as well. To cap off the tile edges here, we're using the Schluter Jolly Profile in Chrome to match the rest of their hardware. And with that first wall done, we can cut out the niche on this wall. I'm going to shoot a laser through that established grout line 
and then I can cut out the niche. And this is gonna work out really well with 12 by 24 tile this way. We can have both the bottom and top of that niche have a grout line running through. It's gonna have a really, really clean look to it. using the Schluter Deco profile in half inch to cap off this tile edge. And this is not only going to cap off the tiles, but it's also going to allow us to insert our fixed piece of glass into this profile. It's going to have a really clean finished look to it this way. For the niche to get this thing looking good, I am going to use a combination of a lot of thin set and a lot of red wedges. So what I like to do here is cut my tiles to the size get a lot of thin set beneath them, and then that way I can alter the position of them to line everything up. For the metal profiles that border it, I cut them on a chop saw with a metal blade, give them a nice clean 45 degree cut, and that way I can have them meet one another, and it's gonna create a really cool border and a clean look. You can see I get the red wedges into all of the edges there, and that's gonna force those profiles together and get the correct spacing so that the grout lines will be consistent. Pretty much the entire ceiling had to be skim goaded, so that meant a lot of sanding. Laticrete Permacolor Grout for this project and for most projects, it is my preferred grout, really easy to work with. Uh, always has a nice color to it, will match with your color sample. And using a damp sponge, after I, I, after I grout these two walls, you're going back with the damp sponge, hitting it at a 45 degree angle, just nice and light. You know, just taking off the excess grout there, not pushing too much pressure onto that. We don't want to pull it out from the lines. And then I can go back a little bit later with the microfiber and clean up any of that leftover haze. In all of my change of planes, I will be applying this color matched silicone. It's the Latticil silicone. It comes in the same color as the grouts. You just want to get that into any corners. Priming everything here with Sherwin Williams Cover Max with a 13mm nap roller. And once that's set up, we can go ahead and hit the ceilings with the ceiling paint, which is Sherwin Williams Premium Ceiling Paint with a 10mm nap. If you're thinking about doing a project like this or you're just a homeowner, I'd strongly recommend you to open up an account with either Benjamin Moore, Sherman Williams, one of those companies, so that you can get premium paint at a really good price. Nice paint makes a big difference. We got this three foot solid door for the pocket door here and just giving it a nice coat of trim paint here with a mohair roller came out really nice. After priming, we take a flashlight to highlight any imperfections, circle them, and then add a little bit of blue coloring to this mud so that we can hit all of our touch-up spots. And between each layer of paint, so for the ceiling, for example, we would prime, sand, paint, sand, and then final coat of paint. It's gonna give us the best possible result this way. When I say sand, I really just mean a quick once over with a sander just to get rid of any imperfections. Since we do have attic access above this, prefer just to drill out all of our pot light holes once the ceiling's finished. Much easier to finish the ceiling without holes in it, so just using a four and an eighth inch bit hole saw for this as we are using four inch pot lights. So we can just cut out all the holes where we want them and then just loop wire from hole to hole and install our pot lights that way. To get a nice clean line here, what we're using is the blue painter's tape and the cheap caulking. We don't want anything high quality here, otherwise it won't have a clean pull. We've experimented, tried a lot of different products, but the cheap stuff for these lines honestly just works the best. For all of the trim, just giving it a quick light sanding and then taking this mohair roller, 
with the Sherwin-Williams trim paint and getting a really, really clean result this way. Sebastian here making light work of these walls and when it gets to this point I just try to stay out of his way because lord knows I cannot cut in like this guy can. Crisp lines every time. For the pocket door here, making some custom split jams. So we just bought some wood uh, jams here and using solid one for where the door will close. But for the top and side that you're seeing now, we do have to cut them as of course it's a pocket door. It's a little bit of custom work here. We're just using these self drilling screws to get through that steel frame there. And the only true way to get those two split jams absolutely perfect would be to wet shim but our install was really, really clean, so they were almost perfect. And then for where this door closes, we're just gonna go ahead and shim it out that way. There's gonna be absolutely no gap between where that door is and where it connects to the jam. For the casing, just marking the reveal here. I believe it was 1 8 that we did for reveal, but I can't remember exactly. And we're just gonna go ahead, mark that reveal, take our casing, mark the cut lines, cut them, and then use this two-part glue to bond them all together that way it can be installed as one piece and then you can see we just kind of lift it into place brad nail it in you just want to be careful if you're doing a pocket door you don't want to use long brads otherwise you'll brad right into the pocket door and then same thing for all the windows here installing just as one piece this is the od flange extender kit i'm using to get our flange to be the correct height as it's far too sunken into that floor and although the instructions do not call for any silicone I just have trust issues when it comes to this stuff, so I added a nice thick bead of siliconing there to make sure everything's going to be watertight. Installing this tower unit in single sink vanity here, although there was space for a larger vanity to double sink, they opted for this, and I get it. Honestly, counter space is really valuable, and having two sinks eats up a ton of counter space, so by going for this layout here, get a ton of storage space there with the tower unit and you still have a decent amount of counter space because you only have one sink it's a really really good idea here um, different people are going to have different preferences i get that you know if you're a couple you might want two separate sinks two separate areas but they didn't and i completely understand i think that this makes a lot of sense We do have some MDF baseboards going in and for a bathroom, real wood or PVC would be recommended. However, in this layout here, all the trim is pretty far away from any water source here. Uh, mainly, of course, we're talking of the shower and it is all sealed. That being said, of course, it still would be preferable to use wood or PVC. We glue our outside corner and for the inside, we do just miter them here. Uh, if it was real wood, of course, would love to cope it. but. MDF doesn't really like to cooperate that way, or at least that's what I find. White silicone for all of the corners on the countertop here. Take some soapy water, spray it down, and then a popsicle stick to get a nice clean line of silicone there. And then where everything meets the wall, just gonna use the crown molding caulking here as it is very strong and less prone to cracking. And it's gonna give us a nice clean finish.
For the tub installation, first things first, we're gonna get into position and then level the legs underneath. Just a few legs, you can just kind of tighten or loosen them to extend or lower them. And that way we can make sure that everything's nice and level with this tub and has no wobble. We attach this brass tail piece and then we can lubricate it with the silicone lube that the OSMB Island Tub Drain Kit comes with. And then that way it's just gonna slide nicely into that drain hole. You can then take a nice thick bead of clear silicone along the bottom and that's gonna hold it in place. Don't be a dummy like me, make sure your dub is straight before you do this. And there we have it. I hope you guys enjoyed, and if you made it this far, if I could maybe ask you to just hit that like button, subscribe, or leave a comment, that would be much appreciated. If you are located in the Mississauga or surrounding areas and you are in need of some work done, our contact information will be down below where you can submit a form. And while I greatly appreciate how much you guys enjoy this work and want to get us out there, we will not be coming to the US. I'm really sorry guys, it's just not going to happen. But thank you anyways. Be sure to check the description for any information uh, and my Amazon store link for any tools and materials that were used here. And in terms of cost, this was about 28,000 US or 37,000 Canadian and took 15 days roughly. It's hard to get the exact numbers here. Uh, we did do the bedroom as well at part of this project, which was done at the same time. So kind of separating the two is a little bit tricky, but in general, these figures are, are somewhat accurate. So. Here you go, if that is at all helpful. And once again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you have a beautiful day.